I'd like to welcome uh, Pastor Wyatt. He's visiting today. He lived in the Bay Area for six years. He's from Texas originally. Uh, he's uh, about to celebrate 20 year uh, anniversary uh, this coming June. Uh, his wife is uh, Amy and, um, and uh, he has three boys, Weston 15 and Ethan 14 and Walker 13. Uh, we welcome him and we ask the Lord to use him to give us the word for today and we pray for him and his family. Pastor White, we welcome you. You may start. Thank you, Pastor Joe. I wanted to make sure that I unmuted my mic. I'm sure we're all Zoom experts by now. I, I would assume that. Um, I know before uh, the COVID hit, uh, most of us probably were not familiar with Zoom, myself included. And I actually had to uh, talk with my children and have them educate me on how to use it because they were using it for school. So go figure, here we all are now, Zoom experts, but let me be the first to say good morning, Western Hills Church family. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. I wanna thank you for the opportunity for me to bring this message from God's word this morning. Again, I'm Pastor Wyatt. Um, we're here in our, our home in Vacaville. And this is a, a special time of year for our family, not just because of Valentine's Day, um, but tomorrow is my birthday. And then the day after that is my wife's birthday. And so we, we like to joke that uh, my wife likes older men. I'm only a day older. So technically that, that fits the, the profile. But um, every Valentine's Day is it's special for our family because um, we the way we celebrate we celebrate as a family by by having a full course fondue meal. And uh, when we were living in Texas, we had some friends that owned a fondue restaurant called Melting Pot. And we're just like, gosh, we should do that at home. And so we decided to start doing that. In fact, I, I, I don't remember how, how long we've been doing this ever since the kids were, were all in diapers. Um, and now they're teenagers and they eat everything. Anyways, but, uh, but I mean, we do fondue. We che cheese fondue with the bread and the fruit. And then we bring our George Foreman out. We grill, we do it all, all there right there on the table. And we have dipping sauces. And of course, my favorite part is the chocolate fondue to, to finish out the meal. It's, it's pretty awesome. But while we're doing that, while we're preparing and eating, we open up to God's word. I have this old family Bible that's been in our, our family for, for quite some time, generations. And we, we pull that old thing out. We open up to 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul defines God's love. And so we read that, we talk about that, we affirm God's love for us and uh, just how much we love one another. And you see, the real reason we are able to celebrate our love for each other today is because of Christ's love for us. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. And whether you have a significant other to be with today or not, we can all celebrate Christ's love. Can somebody give me an amen from their home today? <laughs> amen. Now, we're going to talk about that today. So I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. I truly believe that this is a timely book to study because, uh, the, uh, because of the theme of unity, specifically in chapter 3. That's If, if you were to give it a one-word theme, the theme is, is unity. And so before we, we dive into chapter 3, I want to remind you of the setting in which this letter was written. See, at the time Paul wrote this letter to the church of Ephesus, there was no city that was more famous than Ephesus. It, it was a major place of trade right there off the Mediterranean Sea, and, and Ephesus was, was, was very large. It was a, a robust commercial center that had a pagan temple dedicated to the Roman goddess Diana, and this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So you, you kind of get an, an image there of just uh, how active and how, how uh, I mean, it was, it was a bustling metropolis. And um, I'll even say this regarding Diana. If you've ever seen the movie uh, Wonder Woman, I mean, I love that movie. 
uh, I don't know about the sequel, but the, the original, the OG, I'm, I, I love that. But um, her character was based on the goddess Diana. And so it, it's pretty clear when, when you know, when, when you get an idea of, of what's going on at the time, but it, it's clear where the city was spiritually when a large place of worship is dedicated to an idol, a false goddess. And so it was here in Ephesus that Paul preached regularly um, to spiritually and ethically diverse crowds of people. So it's fitting when Paul writes this letter to the church in the midst of that setting that he addresses this theme of unity within the body of Christ. Now, we could certainly spend a significant amount of time talking about the importance of unity, couldn't we? I mean, my goodness, it's shocking to see how divided our world is today on such a variety of topics and issues. I mean, everybody has an opinion that they have to share. Is anyone with me today? I mean, the negativity, the polarization, all in the midst of a pandemic, and it's easy to get discouraged, isn't it? Well, if that's where you find yourself this morning, I'm glad that you've tuned in because I want to offer you some hope from God's word. See, I believe that the God that we worship is a God of restoration. No matter what the enemy has done to, to deceive, to distract or destroy, God is in the restoration business. Amen? Uh, listen to me, friends. I know what isolation has done. I know how hard it is that we have not been able to, to see each other like before, and I know how discouraged we are of all that is going on around us. But in spite of it all, I still believe that our God is a God of restoration, and he is a God of renewal, and he can take your heart no matter how distant, no matter how cold, no matter how discouraged, and he can draw you near to him and soften your heart and make you new. As the prophet Joel once said, God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And I just love that. And I thoroughly believe that. When I study God's word, I believe what he says, even in dark and difficult circumstances. We trust in our God. We can have joy in Christ. Because yeah. our joy is not rooted in our circumstances, but in our Savior. Now, if we're going to have joy and unity in Christ, as Paul writes about here, then it's critical that we must first understand who we are in Christ. That's how Paul starts off this, this, this letter. So before we kind of jump into chapter 3, I just want to kind of briefly recap what Paul's been talking about. He starts this letter off talking about our identity, and he deals with this issue of, of our identity in Christ. Paul tells us that Christ chose us in him, that he saved us, that he adopted us into his family. Listen, all that we are as Christians rests in our identity in Christ, not in how others see us, not in how the world views us, but how Christ, our Savior, sees us. See, one of the most foundational questions people ask in life is this, who am I? Most foundational question people ask is, who am I? And it's a deep and profound question of identity that Paul is addressing in this letter. See, Ephesians is not your average letter. This entire letter is really meaty. It's not just fun and lighthearted like many of the valentines we may read today or or the valentines you might be writing today there's nothing shallow in this letter at all it is a deep meaty dense philosophical um it, it's it's a letter that is packed full of truth it is a feast but see paul doesn't ease into the letter either i mean right out the gate he talks about predestination and adoption, and redemption and forgiveness. And he doesn't start this biblical feast with a salad or, or a roll or an appetizer. No, Paul serves up a steak, bam, right at the beginning and then all throughout the rest of this letter. And, and the reason Paul 
uh, this letter is so meaty and weighty is because he cannot contain his love for Jesus Christ. He has been so radically changed that it's like his treadmill is constantly running on level 10. I mean, he doesn't slow down. He doesn't stop. He is always living for Jesus. And he's so, so thoroughly convinced of his identity in Christ that it impacts how he lives. And this is critical because Ephesians shows, uh, it shows how our beliefs affect our behavior. Listen, what we believe about God impacts how we live. Our, our theology affects our morality um, or our, our vertical affects our horizontal. And that's essentially how Ephesians is divided. The first three chapters deal with belief, and then the last three chapters deal with how this belief affects our behavior. So belief and behavior. And so as Paul begins this letter, he, he, he had such a clear identity in Christ that he was driven to do whatever it took to spread the gospel, which included preaching to diverse crowds in Ephesus. See, Paul was obsessed with the gospel and how it breaks through cultural and ethnic barriers and how people who are opposed to and hate one another are brought together and united and given a new identity. See, the early church in the book of Acts is a perfect example of how a new identity in Christ brought about tremendous unity and oneness. And the result of that unity that we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 47, was this explosion of growth. It says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I mean, you want to see that today? People getting saved on a daily basis? I mean, doesn't that just sound exciting? Well, do you know why the early church thrived in the midst of such serious persecution? We see their unity and identity was in Christ, not in culture, not in government, not TikTok, not Instagram likes. That's not where their identity was. That's not where their value was rooted in. See, I want you to understand that when you trust Christ as your Savior, when you believe the gospel, you are given a new identity. And a new identity gives us a new purpose with new attitudes and new desires and new relationships. And we no longer want to live in the same way that we did before Christ. And that's Paul's point as, as we move on through chapter two. He says, before Christ, you were dead in your sin, meaning that you had no life until Christ saved you by his grace. As we all remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace, are you saved through faith? And Paul's reminding them, don't forget who you were before Christ and who you are now in Christ. Don't forget who saved you. Don't forget who rescued you. You who were far away, you who were his enemies, Christ brought near through the cross. See, and Christ not only brought us near to him, but near to one another. I mean, can you see how identity and unity are linked? And that's, that's the case that Paul is building heading into chapter 3. How God can take two completely different people groups who, by the way, hate each other. Jews and Gentiles hated each other. And yet, God brings them together through the cross. See, God takes the outcasts the marginalized, the discriminated against, the forgotten, the neglected, the abused. And he says in, in verse 19, specifically of chapter two, he says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. And see, friends, that is the power of the gospel. See, the gospel is not some superficial, artificial, man-made, surface-level, fake, needs-based self-help program. See, the gospel, and you might, you, you might be thinking, and if I were to ask you, what is the gospel? 
you know, we use that term so freely in the church today, but most people couldn't, with their own words, explain what the gospel is. What's the gospel? Quite simply, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sin, that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross, that he was our substitute. You know, when we're in grade school, a substitute teacher takes the place of the teacher. And see, in the same way, Jesus was our sin substitute. He took our place on the cross by dying for our sin. The Bible says, he who knew no sin became our sin. The sinless son of God who never lied before became guilty of being a liar, of being a murderer, an adulterer, a thief. Every sin he paid for so that we could be forgiven. And see, this gospel was the very thing that changed Paul's cold, legalistic heart of a Pharisee into one of the greatest apostles who ever lived. See, Paul gave his life for the advancement of the gospel. Friends, let me ask you, does the gospel have the same effect and impact on your life? Is it something you're casually sitting on and keeping to yourself? Or are you passionate about sharing Christ with everyone you know? You say, well, pastor, of course I'm passionate about the gospel. Well, my question to you is how? What are you doing with it? How long have you lived in your neighborhood? Have you shared you with your neighbors? How long have you worked at your job? Have you shared with your coworkers? In other words, how does your belief affect your behavior? And that's essentially what Paul's getting at in chapter three. Paul was so passionate about his beliefs that it radically affected his behavior so much that it led him to prison. You see, that is where Paul is writing this letter. Paul is writing this letter from a prison in Rome. Look, look at verse one of, of chapter three. And I'm just summarizing. You're thinking, oh, he's just getting started. We're, well, just summarize. But yeah, just look at the first verse. He says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. So here's Paul, a highly devout, extremely religious Jewish Pharisee, He's called to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles and was willing to go to prison for it. And see, this had never been done before. See, what Paul was saying and doing was offensive to the Jews because not only was God bringing together people groups that were divided, but he makes a shocking statement. If you read, if you skip down to verse six, he makes one of the most shocking statements in this whole letter. He says, this mystery. Paul refers to, to the, the gospel as being a mystery to the Gentiles. He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And this was offensive because Gentiles were considered to be unclean. Jews thought that, that they were the superior race and all the other lowly Gentiles were, were, were much less than them. See, but Paul, now he's saying here that, that Gentiles share in the inheritance as heirs with Israel. So Gentiles, the unclean, forgotten, marginalized people group are now on the same level in equal footing with Israel. And, and the Jews had never heard this before. In fact, Paul, Paul mentions, remember, he says, he mentions that, that this was a mystery to them, that it was concealed, but now he's revealing it to them. And so what, what seems like terrible, horrible, no good, bad news for the Jews is the opposite for the Gentiles, this incredibly amazing great news for the Gentiles. Christ has come to reconcile those who were cast aside. 
Jesus did not come for the, the healthy. He came to heal the sick. He came for the lost. He came for the gotten. He came for the marginalized. He came for those who were cast aside. Friends, can I give you some encouragement today? No matter what you have done, no matter how much you think you have messed up God's plan for your life, I tell you what, I, I talk with people almost on a regular basis that all throughout COVID, there's just this element of shame and discouragement and, and I've messed this up and I've, I made a mistake over here and all this regret and guilt it just it's just the enemy just seems to just heap that on us but let me encourage you no matter what you've done no matter how much you may think you have messed up God's plan for your life through all the chaos and the confusion Christ is bringing all this about in order to reconcile you to himself and to one another please don't miss this friends Christ is smack dab in the middle of your struggle and he is working all things out for your good and for his glory. Somebody give him an amen today. See, God is not punishing you. Christ has already been punished for you. You don't have to try harder or do more to earn God's approval. It's not about what you do, but about what Christ has done for you. That is the reconciling nature of Christ. And it's clear from the very beginning of this letter that Christ must be at the center of all we are and all that we do. I mean, can you grasp the passion that Paul writes to the Ephesians? And can I remind you, Paul is writing this letter from prison. <laughs> That's just amazing to me. That Christ has captured his affection so much that he overflows with praise and love for the Lord. Now listen as he closes out chapter 3. Now as I read this, I'm going to be reading verses 14 to 21 specifically. And I want you to follow along with me. Now, regardless of your translation, um, if, if you would rather just listen, the key is I want you to imagine that you're part of the Ephesian church. And, and generally, when, when a letter would come in specifically from Paul, uh, the letter would be read to the entire congregation. So Western Hills, we're all gathered here together today. And I want you to picture your you're, you're Ephesian, you're, you're in Ephesus, and you're part of the Ephesian church, hearing this portion of the letter. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, and all God's people said, amen. You see, the foundation of the gospel the foundation of the church, the foundation of our Christian faith, the very foundation of all that we are and all that we do is this, the love of Christ. Friends, please don't forget to celebrate his love today. 
The Bible says there is no greater love than this, he that lays down his life for his friends. And Paul's prayer here is that we would grasp, truly grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep the love of Christ is. Have you truly experienced the depth of the love of Christ? You know, sometimes we're so familiar with the love of God that it no longer moves us as it should. It no longer stirs our hearts like it once did. Well, I want to close our time with a story that Chuck Colson shares that illustrates this point. This is what he says. It, it, it's a tragic story, and I'd caution if you have uh, uh, little ones in your house, maybe to um, take them out. But here, here's, here's what he says. Chuck Colson, he told the story of a group of American prisoners of war during the Second World War, and they were made to do hard labor in a prison camp. Each had a shovel, and they would dig all day long, and then they'd come in and give an account of their tool in the evening. They would turn their, their shovel in in the evening. In one evening, 20 prisoners were lined up by the guard, and the shovels were counted one at a time. The guard only counted 19 shovels, and then he turned in rage on the 20 prisoners, demanding to know which one did not bring his shovel back. Not a single one of them responded. So the guard took out his gun and said that he would shoot five men if the guilty prisoner did not step forward. Where is the missing shovel? Well, after a moment of tense silence, a 19-year-old soldier stepped forward with his head bowed down. The guard grabbed him, took him to the side, and shot him in the head. And he turned to warn the others that they better be more careful than he was. When he left, the men counted the shovels, and there were 20 of them. The guard had miscounted. The boy had given his life for his friends. I mean, can you imagine the emotions that must have filled their hearts? as they knelt down over the body of their friend. In the five or 10 seconds of silence before this happened, the boy, only 19, had weighed his whole future in the balance. Future wife, perhaps an education, a new vehicle, children, a career, maybe going to eat breakfast with his dad. And yet he chose death so that others might live. Friends, this is the message of the gospel. Whether you choose to celebrate Valentine's Day or not, don't lose sight of the greatest love we will ever know. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than one lay down his life for his friends. To love is to choose suffering for the sake of another. God bless you, church family, as you share his love with others today.